Continuing from introduction part one, I will show you some more aircraft comparisons. Let's set up piano as before. And we'll take a look at the Boeing 777 family. These are the 777s in the database. I will leave out the 777X family, that's the Dash 9 and Dash 8, because these are interesting in their own right, but they are an entirely different airplane. Those of you with long memories may remember the initial definition stages of the 777 back in the early 90s, when Boeing examined several different markets. These A and B market airplanes are files from that time used for comparative studies by various piano users. We will load these now. They all share the same geometry. Ranges that uh, go from around about 4,000 to 6,500 nautical miles with 305 passengers for the A market and 375 passengers for the B market. So this just reflects some initial expectations for a new design. Let's now look at the whole set of piano files. So this is the family as it actually evolved over time and I'll just remind you that everything you've just seen has been calculated from scratch on demand. There are two fuselage lengths that are available. The Dash 200 short fuselage, the Dash 300 longer fuselage, the original span versions and the extended longer span and various engine options. This is now a vast spectrum of configurations. and the payload range picture is overcrowded but looking at a few examples we have a freighter that can carry more than a hundred tons many configurations across the middle some ultra long range options this one is a high-end charter with less than 90 passengers a dense configuration for the UAE with more than 440 seats and this one is an ANA version for the Japanese domestic market, certificated to a low MTOW. It can still manage 3,000 nautical miles, but is typically running ultra short hops of 300 to 500 nautical miles, somewhere down here, with more than 500 passengers. This tremendous variability is ubiquitous in the aviation industry. And as you would expect, it has a massive and complex influence on fuel efficiency and global carbon emissions. So let's make a more manageable selection and we'll focus on late model long span airplanes. We'll pick some 200 LRs, the nominal Boeing configuration. This one is a freighter. That is an Air India configuration for long and thin routes. This one is the high-end charter. And a few 300 ERs. Boeing nominal configuration, Air India, a UAE configuration. So just two fuselage options. Note that all of the 200 LRs, so that's this one, that one, that one, and that one, are basically the same type at the same MTOW, but obviously with very different payload range characteristics. We'll come back to look at the efficiency of these later on. Now turning to the CO2 menu, this menu is mostly used to look at whole database behavior and it does that by loading and compiling data from all plane files in the planes folder in several different ways. 
But first, let me briefly reload our 787 example for part 1. Because I want to show you two fundamental measures that characterize any transportation system that burns fuel, not just airplanes. And these can be seen in the range reports. So this is our 787, 242 passengers over 7725 nautical miles. First, we have the amount of transport in ton kilometers. You can think of transport as a kind of useful work done. So whenever I use the word transport or transport capability, I simply mean ton kilometers, or more conveniently, I may refer to thousands of ton kilometers. And the second measure is the transport efficiency which is simply the transport per unit fuel burn in ton kilometers per kilogram fuel. There is a useful size and capability item that includes these measures and gives you an intuitive overview of the current plane. This draws out every aircraft to the same scale in an 85 meter box and it shows the baseline transport capability which is proportional to the area of this box. Uh, this is distance from zero to the antipodes. So you have range over here and payload in tons on that axis. And also the transport efficiency on this axis and the number of grams of CO2 per available seat kilometer, which is effectively an inverse efficiency. You also get a bit of general info like the span category and approach category, the cabin area per passenger as a rough indicator of the average comfort level, and average cruise speed. Incidentally, the name here refers to the engine emissions data that are used in carbon monoxide, NOx, and unburned hydrocarbon calculations. I will load another aircraft for comparison. A Canada CRJ 700 series. You see the relative size, and the efficiency is less, down to 3.7 from 4.17 for the 787. Another example, a 777 for the UAE. This is a more densely packed aircraft, and it has a higher transport efficiency, 4.59 and the transport capability of 510. And let's load an A320neo. This is an EasyJet configuration. And this one yields a very high value of efficiency of 6.4. Now aircraft, no matter how they are configured, cannot be fully characterized by just one or two numbers but we can generate a very significant global map of transport capability and efficiency by running the entire database and compiling all necessary data from scratch. And I will do that now. So right now, Piano is loading each aircraft file in the database, calculating the geometry, mass and balance and the aerodynamics for it, then integrating its baseline mission step by step to get the transport efficiency. And it's quite busy doing that for 600 aeroplanes. So it's now finished. That exercise took about 20 seconds. I get a series of options and I'll just hit return to all of these. This is our global transport efficiency map for the current Piano database. A picture like this may seem random, but it's full of significant patterns. There are countless long stories here, not just about technical issues, but also about geographic facts, the structures of human society, industrial policies, and other things. Different colors point out some general classifications, like turboprops, the orange points here, business jets in this region, with very low transport capabilities and very low efficiencies. The blue points are single aisle airplanes. The white ones are twin aisles or more. And the pink ones are double deckers. 
The yellow ones, which occupy the high region, are all freighter configurations. It is possible to label any arbitrary set of points that you care to examine. So let's go back to our selection of triple sevens. And I will add the Canada that I just looked at, the CRJ. And the A320 Neo, that one. So the aircraft are now being labeled. Let's look at the efficiency of our 777-200LR examples. And I'll remind you that all of these are at the same MTOW. They have transport efficiencies that range from the mid-region in this point here, which is the nominal Boeing configuration, to this point for the long and thin configuration, to the most efficient aircraft in the entire database, which is the FedEx Freighter, down to the least efficient twin aisle in the database, which is the high-end charter. One type at one MTOW. Now let's move away from the global perspective and look at how a particular aircraft type performs at missions other than its baseline mission. Every individual aircraft has its own efficiency map with the same axis as our global picture here, but the map must now show the performance at all possible combinations of block distance and payload for that particular type. As a first example, I will load a Canada CRJ. A CRJ100. Generating the map for this is actually extremely fast because the missions are short and simple. But before I discuss this one, let me quickly start another calculation for the 787. because that one will be quite a bit slower. The CRJ performance map is overlaid on the global picture, but only covers a narrow region, just a few dots that you can see. The 787 will cover a much wider region. So if we look at this picture here, and I call these efficiency fans, the red line, and here is our Boeing 787, which took 32 seconds to finish. So I will switch to uh, this picture now. The red line is a projection of our familiar payload range boundary, so the aircraft can only operate inside that. Yellow lines are constant payload, or if you prefer constant load factor LF. LF100 here is the baseline full passenger load, in this case 242 passengers. Orange lines are constant range, so you can see 7,000 nautical miles, 9,000, 5,000 over here. You can also see that carrying cargo can have a huge benefit. This is effectively at a load factor of 188. Peak efficiency tends to happen around about 3,000 nautical miles. For long ranges, you carry more fuel just to carry the extra fuel. For short ranges, you uh, never get to cruise anywhere near an optimum. So this is our global transport capability versus transport efficiency map for the 787. There are options for entering any required payloads and ranges. From here, you can also plot block fuel versus transport instead of efficiency versus transport, and you can use higher resolutions. And I will show you a couple of maps with these options now. These take a bit longer to process. So maybe around 90 seconds for a picture like this. This is the same 787 map as before, but with payload now given in tons. 23.05 tons for the load factor 100 case. And we can replot the same information to show the actual fuel burn in tons. Both of these pictures broadly converge to zero, but that is a meaningless point, obviously. So 
You may not have seen aircraft characteristics like these before, but I hope that by now you have got a feeling for their significance. Such data are not simple to calculate and they are rarely, if ever, available in the public domain, but they are vital to making true comparisons when you have a non-cooperating party or if science is politicized or if transparency is not considered desirable by an institution. As a bit of fun, you can easily get a bunch of pictures like these together and put them in a presentation with a tool like Keyword to make a movie. So what I will show you now is the effect that using slightly different assumptions can have on the efficiency maps. I won't go through these frame by frame, but the typical variability or unstated assumptions, things like different flight levels, IFR or RVSM, uh, westbound or eastbound or constant flight level, different reserve assumptions, 5%, 3% contingency, etc. Passenger weight, uh, LRC or MRC Mach number choices, small differences, 1% delta on SFC or on drag or on OEW, aeroelastic or rigid airframe, etc. So checking that all assumptions are the same really matters. Provided that you're confident that you understand the actual underlying assumptions in someone's data, and provided you can trust them, it is possible to run very accurate comparisons with any well-calibrated piano model. I will remind you of the payload range for our 787 that we looked at in part 1. And this is the same picture, the payload range predicted by our piano model of the 787-8. And this one happens to model closely the published Boeing configuration that is freely available in the public domain in the 2014 Airport Planning or ACAP document. If you match the axis correctly, you can get this overlay of the piano prediction and the ACAP payload range diagrams. And you can see that the two are a perfect match to within line reading accuracies. Red line is piano and that is the ACAP prediction. That's not quite enough. We should also compare points that lie within the payload range diagram. And I'll do a quick sample comparison. Let me set the units to pounds. So MTOW 502500, OEW 259500 pounds. I will now pick a point that is easy to read. For example, the ACAP picture indicates that at an OEW plus payload of 290,000 pounds here, and the takeoff or break release weight of 360,000 pounds, which is this one here, the claimed block distance is almost exactly 3,000 nautical miles. I can zoom in. maybe just a hairline above 3,000. So if you remember 360,000 pounds and 290,000 pounds, I go into piano. Put the takeoff mass of 360,000 pounds and our payload has to be 290,000 pounds minus our OEW, which from down here is 259,500. 259500. Hit OK. That gives us a payload of 30,500 pounds and a distance of just over 3,000 nautical miles. And that is very close. And you will find that other points inside the payload range diagram match up very nicely too. Now, if the assumptions are compatible and the entire payload range domain is in essence a perfect match, then of necessity calculations of transport efficiency and fuel burns, such as we have been looking at, must also match up. And fuel burns, of course, also quantify the direct carbon emissions under all operational scenarios. I invite you to verify all numbers independently if you can. In a future lecture, I will define the 787 model from scratch to accuracy levels very close to these. But for now, we will move on to examine the ICAO CO2 metric. So I will pause here and continue in the next segment.